this formidable steel giant emerged as an emblem of aviation's glorious era. Its imposing presence, revolutionary engineering solutions, unprecedented altitude capabilities, and unmatched speed made it both intimidating and awe-inspiring. Ironically, despite being hailed as the epitome of high-speed aerial combat, the aircraft ultimately contributed to its demise. Welcome, aviation enthusiasts, Aviation Pill here, and today we delve into the prowess of the Interceptor League champion, introducing the MiG-25. In the latter half of the 20th century, aviation witnessed an unprecedented era marked by remarkable technological advancements and ambitious endeavors. Previous benchmarks in flight speeds and altitudes were swiftly surpassed, rendering once extraordinary achievements mundane. The pursuit of faster and higher flying aircraft became the norm, particularly in the realm of combat aviation with a focus on fighters and bombers. By the late 1950s, the Cold War rivals had achieved a precarious balance, the principle of Mutually assured destruction necessitated countermeasures against potential threats, leading to the development of offensive weapons countered by defensive systems. For the USSR, safeguarding its vast territory against the formidable fleet of American strategic bombers posed a critical challenge. Two primary solutions were explored, the deployment of surface-to-air missiles capable of engaging targets at various speeds and altitudes, and the enhancement of interceptor aircraft, which formed the backbone of air defense forces. However, interceptors faced limitations, notably in speed and altitude, hindering their effectiveness against high-flying reconnaissance aircraft like the U-2. As the era progressed, the emergence of faster and more advanced aircraft, including potential bombers like the Valkyries alongside reconnaissance planes like the Archangels, necessitated a more capable interceptor. The Mikoyan and Gurevich Design Bureau, renowned as MiG, was tasked with developing a comprehensive solution. Beginning in 1956, the Bureau received directives for the creation of a fighter interceptor with specific performance criteria, operating at altitudes of 20 to 25 kilometers, 65,000 to 82,000 feet, achieving speeds of Mach 2.5 to 3, approximately 3,000 kilometers per hour, 1,600 knots, and equipped with advanced radar and air-to-air -air missiles. Furthermore, as the designated main interceptor for air defense forces, the aircraft had to be mass-produced implying cost-effectiveness in manufacturing and maintenance, minimal infrastructure requirements, and accessibility for a broad pool of pilots. These constraints were not to be underestimated, as they dictated the practical utility of the aircraft. While various promising projects from Avro, North American, and Lockheed existed, their implementation was hindered by exceeding these parameters. Engineers faced the challenge of striking a delicate balance between meeting performance requirements and operational constraints. For quite some time, the realization of such an aircraft appeared more theoretical than practical, primarily due to the absence of an engine capable of effectively operating at Mach 3 speeds. However, a solution was eventually devised. During the 1950s, there was a surge in the development of cruise missiles, exemplified by the Soviet Tu-121 project, intended to fly at altitudes exceeding 20 kilometers and speeds close to the requirements of the MiG. Although the Tu-121 project didn't proceed to production due to the dominance of ballistic missiles at the time, it left behind a significant legacy. The KR-15 engine emerged from this context, a large turbojet engine engineered for high-speed flights with impressive power. However, its performance was compromised at low speeds, and its operational lifespan was initially limited to a mere 15 hours, suitable for a one-way cruise missile flight launched by solid fuel boosters but inadequate for an aircraft. Extensive modifications were undertaken to enhance the engine's capabilities. Its operational speed range was expanded, and its lifespan was increased first to 50 hours and later, with further program development, to 300 hours, an improvement though still modest. Despite the need to reduce thrust, the engine, capable of producing between 7.5 TF, 16,500 lbf, without afterburner and up to 11.2 TF, 24,600 lbf, with afterburner, 
proved suitable for the MiG's requirements. Thus, the MiG was equipped with the R-15B300 engine, marking a significant milestone in its development process. Numerous prototype versions of the E-150 and E-152 were developed, maintaining a classic aircraft layout reminiscent of the larger MiG-21. However, as aviators rigorously tested these prototypes, it became increasingly evident that they would not meet the required performance standards. The nose cone lacked sufficient space for a large radar, the fuselage struggled to accommodate necessary equipment and fuel, and control issues arose at speeds exceeding Mach 2. These limitations stem from the fundamental layout of the aircraft, which reached its maximum potential without room for further improvement. A pivotal moment prompting a re-evaluation of the project came with the incident involving the downing of the Lockheed U-2 reconnaissance aircraft in May 1960. While hailed as a success for USSR air defense, the details revealed shortcomings. The U-2 was shot down over Sverdlovsk after traversing half the country, evading interceptors for hours until ultimately succumbing to S-75 surface-to-air missiles. This event sparked debates over the efficacy of missiles versus aircraft, with a notable argument emerging in favor of missiles due to their effectiveness compared to interceptors. Aviators found themselves under considerable pressure to devise a more effective solution. The updated project, designated as E-155, marked a departure from the conservative approach observed with the E-152. Designers seemed to unleash their creativity fully, discarding previous layouts and essentially starting from scratch, incorporating advancements from the global aviation sphere. The result was a radical transformation. The aircraft featured a spacious, free-flowing nose, side-mounted air intakes, a trapezoidal wing, and a twin fin tail. This marked a significant departure from the earlier E-152, which bore closer resemblance to the traditional MiG-21. Notably, this evolution wasn't immediate. Initially, the design retained a more familiar wing configuration akin to older prototypes, but research compelled a departure from tradition in favor of a larger, slender trapezoidal wing with slight sweep. Despite increased drag, this design, along with modifications to the upper fuselage, enhanced lift, improving performance at lower speeds. The high lift system, comprising ailerons and flaps without slats, reflected simplicity in design. Initially planned as a single fin configuration with a pair of all-moving horizontal stabilizers flanking the engines, tests revealed limitations at Mach 3, leading to the adoption of a twin fin tail. Additionally, ventral fins were incorporated, an avant-garde feature for the era but ultimately successful in practice. Other features included two brake flaps above and below the nozzles in the tail, complemented by a brake parachute atop the fairing. The landing gear adopted a tricycle arrangement, with a two-wheeled front leg and one substantial wheel per main gear, balancing the aircraft's weight distribution while optimizing internal volume. Despite its seemingly straightforward layout, the aircraft boasted numerous nuances, such as a slightly downward-sloping nose, angled wing consoles, outward-spread tail fins, and a slightly upward-tilted engine thrust vector. These subtle adjustments aim to enhance aerodynamics, crucial in navigating limited thrust and achieving the requisite high speeds. The aircraft's compact layout belied its epic dimensions, with a length ranging from 21 to 22.3 meters, a wingspan of 14 meters, and a height of 6.5 meters. These proportions were largely dictated by the power plant's requirements. The R-15B300 engine stands out as one of the few components directly carried over from the previous prototypes to the E-155. However, the focus here is specifically on the engine. Everything else surrounding it underwent a complete overhaul. With the inclusion of two sizable engines, maintaining a degree of compactness necessitated their close proximity. This can be observed in the tail section where the large, adjustable nozzles intersect. Equally critical were the air intakes, pivotal in optimizing the engine's performance and consequently, the overall aircraft operation. Positioned at the front, these intakes feature two substantial wedges with adjustable lower doors. The intake system incorporated multiple intake ramps, boundary layer removal slots, and a turbulator position centrally. These components collectively function to decelerate and compress incoming air. The rationale behind this design is straightforward. When air rushes into the blades at speeds reaching 3,000 km per hour, there's a risk of blade displacement. However, the intake serves as both a protective barrier for the blades and an additional compressor. Furthermore, a dynamic mechanism enabled the intake to adapt to varying speeds and altitudes, essential for maintaining optimal performance across different flight conditions. Without such adaptability, a specialized high-speed engine would encounter challenges in operation. Engineers faced another significant challenge in addressing a chronic issue prevalent among high-speed interceptors, the trade-off between aerodynamics and fuel capacity. 
optimal aerodynamics necessitated a compressed airframe, reducing available space for fuel reserves, often resulting in limited range. The MiG's internal volume was predominantly occupied by fuel tanks, comprising six in the fuselage and four in the wing, with some versions even featuring tanks in the fins. Notably, these tanks were adapted free volumes, augmenting fuel capacity but introducing a side effect. The considerable range of temperatures experienced during flight caused noticeable expansion and contraction of the hull materials, leading to potential leaks. While such occurrences were observed in some high-speed aircraft, the proximity of the MiG's tanks to the engines posed a heightened risk of fire. The solution to this issue was implemented radically. Traditional aviation riveting methods were abandoned in favor of welding, transforming entire sections of the aircraft into rigid, monolithic structures. Furthermore, a specialized fuel, T6 kerosene, characterized by a high ignition temperature, was employed. As fuel was consumed, nitrogen, an inert gas, was introduced into the tanks, serving to prevent combustion within. These measures proved crucial for safely storing fuel at supersonic speeds within an environment akin to a furnace, with temperatures ranging from 150 to 180 degrees Celsius. The total fuel mass in the MiG could reach up to May 14, 15 tons. While the option existed to attach an additional tank, this practice was not commonly pursued. Flying at Mach 3 poses a significant challenge due to the extreme temperatures reached, often reaching 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. Conventional aluminum alloys, commonly utilized in aviation, are incapable of withstanding such conditions. While titanium initially appears to be a viable solution due to its heat resistance, it poses significant drawbacks in terms of cost, processing complexity, and repair difficulties. While suitable for unique aircraft, mass-produced planes cannot feasibly utilize titanium. An alternative material of choice is steel. Renowned for its heat resistance, durability, and low thermal conductivity, steel presents a more affordable option, constituting 80% of the aircraft's structure. However, this choice comes with a trade-off, steel's weight. The dry weight of the aircraft soared to 20 tons, surpassing that of a fully equipped Su-15 without weapons and fuel. The interceptor's maximum takeoff weight exceeded 36.7 tons, with other variants surpassing 40 tons. To put this into perspective, this mass is comparable to that of Ember E-170-175 regional airliners and on par with the Hefty 2128. Numerous prototype versions of the E-150 and E-152 were developed, maintaining a classic aircraft layout reminiscent of the larger MiG-21. However, as aviators rigorously tested these prototypes, it became increasingly evident that they would not meet the required performance standards. The nose cone lacks sufficient space for a large radar, the fuselage struggled to accommodate necessary equipment and fuel, and control issues arose at speeds exceeding Mach 2. These limitations stem from the fundamental layout of the aircraft, which reached its maximum potential without room for further improvement. A pivotal moment prompting a re-evaluation of the project came with the incident involving the downing of the Lockheed U-2 reconnaissance aircraft in May 1960. While hailed as a success for USSR air defense, the details revealed shortcomings. The U-2 was shot down over Sverdlovsk after traversing half the country, evading interceptors for hours until ultimately succumbing to S-75 surface-to-air missiles. This event sparked debates over the efficacy of missiles versus aircraft, with a notable argument emerging in favor of missiles due to their effectiveness compared to interceptors. Aviators found themselves under considerable pressure to devise a more effective solution. Designing the cockpit presented a significant challenge for engineers as they needed to balance the glazing's resistance to high loads and temperatures with the combat aircraft's visibility requirements. Traditional metal caps with windows were not suitable for this purpose. To address this issue, a new heat-resistant plexiglass was developed specifically for the MiG, boasting a thickness of 2 cm in the frontal area and integrated cooling to withstand temperatures up to 230 degrees Celsius. Similar plexiglass materials were subsequently adopted for other high-speed aircraft identifiable by their tendency to become cloudy during prolonged storage, especially under sunlight. Due to space constraints, the MiG-25 could not accommodate a second crew member, making it the heaviest single-seat combat aircraft. To alleviate the workload on the sole pilot, the aircraft was heavily automated, with systems for power plant control, overall system management, and even an autopilot. Communication systems between aircraft and ground were also prioritized reflecting the aircraft's role as part of a larger air defense complex, necessitating robust ground infrastructure. The RP-25 Smirche Airborne Radar Station significantly influenced the aircraft's nose design, 
prompting alterations during the design phase. Originally developed for the Tu-128, this radar boasted considerable power, detecting targets at distances of approximately 100 kilometers and tracking them at distances of 50 kilometers. Subsequent upgrades to the aircraft will be discussed later. The McQueen design team embarked on the ambitious project of creating the aircraft in 1961, with a decision early on to develop two versions simultaneously, the basic E-155P, an interceptor, and the E-155R, a reconnaissance aircraft. This dual approach stemmed from the aircraft's remarkable performance capabilities. By 1964, both variants had progressed to the prototype assembly stage. The reconnaissance aircraft conducted its inaugural flight in March 1964 followed by the interceptor's maiden flight in September of the same year. Throughout the testing phase, various modifications and alterations were made to the aircraft, resulting in a blend of adopted and discarded exotic solutions, ultimately shaping the aircraft into its recognizable form. Over the ensuing years, rigorous testing ensued, shrouded in strict secrecy. The aircraft's public debut occurred in 1967 when four planes participated in an air parade near Moscow's Domodedovo Airport. This marked the first public exposure of the aircraft, leading to an emotional reaction from spectators, particularly foreign observers who eventually bestowed the NATO index, FOXFAT, upon it. The aircraft's capability to reach speeds of approximately Mach 3 astonished observers, previously thought to be achievable only by the A-12 and XB-70 aircraft. Foreign intelligence agencies erroneously concluded that the MiG-25 was a fully-fledged multi-role Mach 3 fighter, triggering a fervent reaction. Despite the exaggeration, this reaction spurred progress, catalyzing the development of the F-15 Eagle, inspired more by fantasies about the Soviet multi-role fighter than the actual MiG itself. The MiG-25, however, possessed numerous revolutionary features, some of which surprised testers, yielding both positive and challenging outcomes, occasionally resulting in accidents. Nonetheless, engineers successfully mastered the formidable aircraft. Record-breaking flights became commonplace, with achievements such as a 1,000-kilometer segment flown at speeds exceeding Mach 2 by 1967. In October 1969, the reconnaissance variant was officially commissioned as the MiG-25R, followed by the interceptor's service acceptance in 1972, leading to the birth of the MiG-25P. Production of the aircraft was undertaken at the Gorky Aviation Plant, now known as Sokol. For the plant, this endeavor proved no less challenging than for the aircraft's creators. Transitioning from manufacturing the MiG-21 to the MiG-25 was akin to moving from a sparrow to a behemoth. The primary challenge lay in mastering the production of steel components and their welding. This necessitated the development of numerous new technologies, methods, and equipment, including automated welding complexes for sections. The MiG-25, in certain aspects, resembled a tank more than an airplane. However, despite these unconventional features, the production process proved successful. A delicate balance between cost and effectiveness was maintained, although the MiG-25 was undoubtedly more expensive and complex compared to its counterparts. It remained within parameters conducive to mass production. The figures speak volumes. From 1969 to 1985, approximately 1,190 aircraft were manufactured. During the series' peak in the latter half of the 1970s, nearly 90 aircraft were produced annually. Acquiring proficiency with the aircraft proved relatively manageable, aided significantly by the training versions. Notably, the training variants, such as the MiG-25PU, featured a redesigned nose, replacing the radar with a second cockpit. While unconventional, this approach mirrored similar configurations seen in training versions of other aircraft, like the A-12, Titanium Goose, or the Tu-128. Similarly, a training variant of the reconnaissance aircraft, known as the MiG-25RU, was developed. Operating within the cockpit was generally comfortable, provided one adhered to operational modes and refrained from exceeding speed limits. However, the solitary nature of the pilot's tasks occasionally posed challenges, even with automation. Equipment within the cockpit resembled that of space suits, offering assistance in both normal and extreme conditions. Notably, ejection from the MiG-25, even at Mach 2, though survivable, was an extreme and highly traumatic experience. In-flight performance was marked by impressive takeoffs, with the afterburners contributing to a dramatic spectacle. However, acceleration was gradual, and the heavy aircraft lifted off the runway calmly before gaining momentum. Within five minutes of takeoff, the aircraft could soar to an altitude of 20 kilometers at supersonic speeds, an ordinary feat that record-breaking flights surpassed even more rapidly. The MiG-25 excelled at high altitudes, 
with its engines operating most efficiently at supersonic speeds, maintaining a cruising speed of around Mach 2.35, or approximately 2,500 km per hour, while the aircraft could achieve speeds up to Mach 2.65 for extended periods. Reaching the maximum permissible speed of Mach 2.83 was not sustainable due to severe heating issues. Exceeding this limit risked melting the canopy within 5 minutes, while engine durability deteriorated after approximately 15 minutes at maximum speed. Regarding altitude capabilities, the MiG-25 possessed a service ceiling of 22 km with missile suspension and 25 km without. Notably, in 1977, the aircraft attained an astounding altitude of 37,650 meters, further demonstrating its exceptional performance capabilities. Flight ranges varied depending on factors such as payload and fuel usage, with subsonic flights covering around 1,700 km and supersonic flights approximately 1,200 km. In combat scenarios, interception ranges range from 320 to 600 km with the option for one-way missions beyond the maximum range. The aircraft's armament primarily comprised the R-40 air-to-air missile, equipped with either a thermal homing head or a semi-active seeker, capable of engaging targets at a range of 36 kilometers. Given its high-speed interception role, the MiG-25's armament emphasized missiles over guns. Maneuverability at Mach 3 was limited, with the aircraft outperforming simpler targets, but maneuvering slightly better than a ballistic missile. While capable of decent flight performance at low speeds, the MiG-25 excelled in high-speed interception rather than multi-role operations. Fuel efficiency and throttle response at supersonic speeds were mediocre, with a noticeable delay in throttle response. Nevertheless, the aircraft's airframe facilitated relatively comfortable landing speeds, with takeoff and landing distances facilitating operational ease and obviating the need for costly airfield upgrades. While interceptors played a pivotal role within the USSR, Reconnaissance planes were initially deployed beyond its borders. In the 1970s, Soviet MiG-25 our aircraft conducted periodic flights over Iranian territory in response to intelligence operations conducted jointly by the CIA and the Iranian Air Force. However, this activity ceased following the Islamic Revolution of 1979. The MiG-25 found itself in combat situations during the early 1970s when Soviet reconnaissance planes were dispatched to Egypt to fly over Israel. Despite interception attempts by the Israeli Air Force, the MiG-25's formidable speed, reaching Mach 3.2, proved evasive. These flights contributed to the formulation of a detailed defense strategy for the region, a factor in the initial success of the Egyptian army during the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Concerns over the MiG-25 extended beyond reconnaissance capabilities to its potential as a bomber. In the late 1960s, plans emerged for a high-altitude, high-speed bomber, resulting in the development of the MiG-25RB based on the reconnaissance variant. Equipped to bomb targets from altitudes exceeding 20 km at speeds of Mach 2.5, the MiG-25RB raised accuracy concerns, offset by the destructive potential of nuclear bombs. Subsequent variants, including the MiG-25BM armed with KH-58 missiles, further expanded its capabilities for radar station destruction. Exported MiG-25 aircraft became coveted assets, supplied to nations such as Algeria, Libya, Iraq, Syria, India, and North Korea. However, their deployment varied in success and drama across conflicts. In Lebanon, Syrian MiG-25s encountered Israeli F-15s, while Libyan MiG-25s engaged in reconnaissance and patrols, occasionally encountering American F-14s. Indian MiG-25s contributed to confrontations with Pakistan, including a notable flight over Islamabad. During the Iran-Iraq conflict, Iraqi MiG-25s faced off against Iranian F-14s, with varying outcomes in aerial clashes. Subsequently, during Desert Storm, MiG-25s faced overwhelming opposition from fourth-generation fighters, with most losses occurring on the ground rather than in aerial combat. By 2003, many MiG-25s were rendered inoperable due to maintenance issues, with some even discovered buried in sand. Despite sporadic use in conflicts like Chechnya and Nagorno-Karabakh, MiG-25s were gradually phased out of service at the turn of the 21st century, although some remain in limited service in certain countries. The 1960s marked a pinnacle in high-speed jet aviation, and the creation of the MiG-25 epitomized this era. It emerged as the epitome of high-speed interception, obviating the need for adversaries capable of Mach 3 penetration. Ironically, by neutralizing this threat, it rendered itself obsolete as a highly specialized interceptor. Serving as the pinnacle of its class, the MiG-25 effectively became its final embodiment. Overall, 
the MiG-25's trajectory can be deemed auspicious. It arrived when needed, fulfilled its role, and gracefully retired, leaving a profound impact on subsequent generations of fighters. This wraps up our exploration of the MiG-25. With that said, thanks for joining us for this look at the MiG-25. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more great aviation content. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.